friends, in the previous lecture, I have talked about the sources of metals and we have seen that we can get metals in the form of minerals and ores from land mass and they are distributed all over the earth's crust. We can get metals from the sea, not only sea water, but marine organisms, manganese nodules in the sea floor and we have seen that another source of metals is the is metallurgical wastes or metal scrap because from them also we can get extract metals and we call them secondary metals. Now, today we concentrate on getting metallic values from ores and minerals available in land masses, in land deposits. Now, very rarely these days we find that there are mineral particles on the surface ready for uh, a, a extraction process. Maybe there was a time when uh, there were boulders of ores and minerals which were suitable for uh, an extraction process by our ancients, but nowadays we need some kind of a dressing of the ores to prepare them for subsequent extraction processes. So, there are two words which are used, uh, they both mean the same. One is mineral beneficiation and the other is mineral dressing. Well, there are people prefer uh, different terminologies and essentially mineral beneficiation and mineral dressing uh, can be defined as processing raw materials that is the ore to yield marketable products. That you have mined some ore from somewhere, but no industry would like to buy because they would like to have something in a better form, something that can be readily used in the industry. So, what you have to supply to an industry that is in the extraction business is a marketable product. And that means that having taken the ore out of a mine, we have to dress it up, we have to do something to it to make it more acceptable to the industry. In mineral beneficiation, this is done by by means that do not destroy the physical and chemical identity of minerals. This means we do a lot of things to that ore that we have got, but we do not uh, change the chemical identity and all we can do is what we call unit processes and unit operations rather. Unit operations are for dressing up. ores 
without changing the physical and chemical identity. Say for example, you have an ore which has a lot of unwanted materials, gang materials as I say, you know sand and aluminum silicates that you really do not want to go into the uh, processes. Suppose you have a method of taking them out, you have not done anything to the minerals, the mineral has stayed as such. Suppose the particles are too big, you crush them and ground them and you make them finer. Uh, you have not changed the chemical or physical identity. These are called unit operations and mineral beneficiation techniques essentially mean such operations where you are making it more acceptable to the industry, but you are not changing the basic nature chemical or physical nature. However, the technologies have now changed a great deal and there are occasional exceptions to this. Uh, say if an iron ore um, which is or some other mineral which has a component F E O, we can do magnetizing roasting means heat it up slightly in oxidizing atmosphere make it F E 3 O 4 and you remove it by a magne a magnetic uh, treatment. This is not a unit operation, it becomes a unit process because you are playing with the chemical nature of a mineral, but sometimes this is accepted within the scope of unit operations in mineral beneficiation. There are also some situations where we take out a mineral value by chloridizing it and it comes out as a vapor as a gas or as a liquid and we have separated the metallic value by chloridizing that and we include that in mineral beneficiation. But generally it is the physical operations or unit operations which come under the uh, definition of mineral beneficiation. Now the most common operation in mineral beneficiation is crushing and grinding using various equipment. Now, I am sh showing some very basic equipment like you have big particles of uh, ore, you feed them into a device where this is banging against it all the time to very hard surfaces, very often these are tungsten alloys. So, gradually it gets broken into smaller pieces and you get finer particles coming out. There can be other kinds of devices like this again, the ore is squeezed through uh, smaller and smaller openings it comes out and here there is something which is rotating all the time. So, the uh, breakage is much more efficient, there is another device, the ore comes into the peripheries has, has to enter into uh, this passage whole thing is of course, is rotating as you see here and the ore comes out as in finer form. There are also these are called mills, the ore come in here there is something rotating all the time and it uh, ore particles get squeezed between two hard surfaces and this they are hit by these hammers. Here is another one ore comes and comes out much becomes much uh, particle size drops. Now, this sort of operation is the technical name for this is commu comminution. We call it crushing and grinding, but commun comminution is a more technical term which is actually a unit operation for size reduction. Now, obviously, 
uh, this operation requires a good amount of energy and an estimate is you need 5 kilowatt hour per ton to 25 kilowatt hour per ton depending on the kind of equipment you are using or the how hard or how brittle the ore particles are. Very often uh, comminution is the first step in mineral processing because it achieves uh, several things. Not only are the particle size reduced, but you create new surfaces and you liberate minerals. Now, what do you mean by the word liberation of minerals? Uh, to understand that, you must understand what normally is an ore particle like. A particle of ore or rather a mass of ore would comprise of agglomerates of various mineral particles. Different kinds of mineral particles are agglomerated and it has happened in nature over millennia and they form a, a mass in which there are different minerals and there are also gang materials they have been all squeezed together. Now, if we want to treat the mineral values by some processes to extract metal one metal or more metals. So, we need to liberate it from the from each other and from the gang materials and this is very effectively done if you break things up. We say that when you have a single mineral, single mineral particles together, agglomerated together, we call them free particles. And when there are different uh, minerals together in an aggregate, we call them locked particles. So, essentially by size reduction, we try to unlock the, the, the minerals. And of course, you can uh, we can always talk about a degree of locking or a degree of um, liberation. The more liberated they are, the more freer particles or more single minerals would be available in the mass. The, the def definition of degree of liberation is the percentage of mineral or phase occurring as free particles in relation to the total of that mineral occurring in free or locked forms. And conversely, the degree of locking of a mineral is the percentage occurring as locked particles in relation to the total occurring in free and locked forms. Now, we need not go into these details, essentially you get the idea that we have to break to free the mineral particles one kind of from, from the other kinds of things. Now, when we reduce the size, then this happens quite automatically. Now, here is a schematic representation of a of a mass of ore, where there are different kinds of minerals locked up. And this is one kind of mineral, this is another kind of mineral, the white one and the, the, this is the hatched one. And when we size reduction take place, then this is broken, maybe lines of fracture could be here, the lines of fracture could be here and very often the lines of fracture go along the intergranular boundaries. By grain, we mean one kind of particle, a mineral particle, this is one grain this is another grain which is another mineral particle. So, very often it will crack along these lines and they will get liberated. Now, sometimes there can be this kind of fracture also means not only it will go along the boundaries of different grains, but across a particular mineral that can also break, but no matter what happens 
one thing is sure if you break the the aggregate into smaller sizes you liberate more of the minerals from one another than from the gang this will happen even if the cracks are along the grain boundaries or even if it goes through uh, uh, as, uh, some grains it does not matter we need this so when you have reduced the size by comminution then you are creating much larger surface area and this will be advantageous in processes where we need larger surface area like if you want to go for leaching dissolution in a, in a acid or in an alkali the larger the surface area the better will be the uh, rate of dissolution so not only we are creating larger surface area by breaking the particles we create new surface areas new surfaces which may be more active than the old surfaces because they have not been weathered they are fresh they are ready to react to the environment so the comminution achieves many things it achieves liberation of grains which one kind of particles from the other kind of particles it gets liberated from the gang part gang material unwanted material by using the size we create larger surface area we also create new surfaces which are more active there are some processes where we might like to have large particles like at one time the blast furnace operation required fairly large particles because in the blast furnace you need to have porosity but today the tendency is not to have natural particles we actually take finer materials make sinters out of them sinters are again larger particles we create uh, the uh, have the porosity in the bed very few processes today would like to have large particles most of them would operate on fine particles of course the the degree of fineness that we need will depend on the processes we operate if we have a fluidized bed processing in a fluidized bed is where you have the particles uh, are fluidized by a gas coming from the bottom screen obviously they have to be fine smaller particles because then they are easily fluidized but then if they are too fine then they will fly off so there is there is a size uh, limitation they should be fine but not too fine in mineral beneficiation techniques like flotation we want finer particles we want large surfaces which will attach the particles will attach to soap bubbles and float up and so unless the particles are very fine the soap bubbles will not be able to carry them up it's like when you do washing with soap the dirt comes out with the soap bubbles but you know, if they had been large particles flotation will not work so we need finer particles in many many processes uh, as i said for if there are surface properties involved the surface is come into picture finer particles are lighter in weight they are purer uh, in terms of the mineral value so the crushing and grinding would be one of the first steps that we will need crushing and grinding also has to be followed by a process called sizing you simply cannot undergo comminution crush and grind and leave it at that you have to define to what degree you have reduced the size and for that we need screening now you may have seen uh, the way uh, the housewife you know screens an atta they have a circular device of perforated base and they will put the atta and if when they do that the finer things goes and the coarser things stay on the top and they rejected 
something similar is done for uh, in the industry also that we have uh, perforated base say this could be say about uh, diameter about 200 millimeter and about 50 millimeter high very usually in the laboratories they are made of brass this and it is there are screens and they have standard openings so if we do this sort of thing then the finer particles will go through and coarser particles will remain on top but this is uh, what we what we do in the laboratory in small scale in the industry this will not happen what we can do we can have we can have a stack of um, uh, such screens the the uh, coarser ones will be on the top the finer ones will be at the bottom so if there is a series of screens like that and they are vibrated in a stack so the finer and finer particles keep going towards finer and finer screens and the coarser ones on top so we have now uh, we do a size classification that between this size to this size in this screen this size to this size in that screen etc etc we have to have the size reduction within certain limits because industrial processes define that we want our the input materials to be in this size range now the in the industry of course they do not want they don't want this vibrating screens like that there are other processes like for example they may have an incline with rods at certain spacing and the and the ore goes above them the whole thing is vibrated those that are finer than the openings between the rods will go down and the coarse and walls will be on top and there could be a series of such things so the in processes there are also similar and other methods this parallel rod device is called grizzly these grizzlies are used for uh, size reduction also there are other uh, other devices so essentially we always want the input material in an industrial process of a particular size and that is done by mineral beneficiation technique a comminution to give you an example why uh, what happens in a size reduction here is a, a simple to give you an idea as to what we mean by size reduction this is a typical size ranges for various uh, materials it is in angstrom unit you know that we mean by one angstrom is 10 to the power minus 4 micrometer that is 10 to the power minus 7 millimeter 10 to the power minus 8 centimeter and you get an idea here that the fine silt would be here the river gravel means the smaller particles are here beach sand is here this is a log scale now very often uh, we will actually operate in in this kind of rain in most industrial processes 200 mesh mesh is a unit defined uh, most books say that what is a mesh and about 10 mesh is about 2 millimeters 200 mesh is about 0 0.075 5 millimeter and they, they are available the standard uh, conversion things so we would may most many industrial processes will operate in, in, in this range to give you a simple example of why we need to do this kind of uh, uh, sizing so here is uh, the schematic diagram of an electrostatic separator which can be used for electrically conducting mineral particles suppose we have an ore body in which there are particles of minerals which are electrically conducting 
others are not electrically conducting. Now, as such, if you let that go under an electric field, everything will pass through, there will be no separation. But if you do comminution, if you reduce the size, if you have liberated the electrically conducting particles from other kinds of things, then we can use a device like this, where the feed will come on a on a belt, conveyor belt, and these are the particles of ore, where there are all kinds of grains, all kinds of minerals with different uh, electrical conductivity uh, properties, and we will have a separation here, because those that are electrically conducting will fly off, because the, this is the uh, rotating drum that will attract. Uh, so, non conducting will go at some places, electrically conducting particles will go at another places. Uh, so, we can have a separation based on electro, uh, electrostatic charges. Now, all processes of mineral beneficiation exploit one or more properties of ore particles. And here is a list of unit operations to indicate what is being exploited where. What I described is as comminution or size reduction obviously exploits the property of brittleness. Because the min, the ore particles are brittle, brittle does not mean that any force will break it, but some force or other will break it some need more force, some need less force, but they are brittle in the sense that it will not get deformed. So, we have the grain ag aggregates of different particles, they will break into smaller smaller fraction. So, we are exploiting the property of brittleness. Then we are doing sizing, means when you do screening using various devices, so there is a grizzly or other things and we are creating different fractions, we are exploiting size difference amongst particles. This can be done in various ways, in the earlier days it used to be done by hand picking and hand picking was also uh, made quite advanced and it is still done in some places. That on a conveyor belt, whatever has been mined is going and there are skilled laborers on laborers on both sides, men and women who will pick up particles of a certain size, they have been trained to do that and coarser particles on one side, finer particles on one side. They can also do something more, they can be trained to pick up particles rich in cert certain kind of minerals that can also be done. This is called hand uh, uh, picking, but then uh, big industries hand picking will no longer do. Then there are hydraulic classification, there are many many kinds of devices and I will not go into that, mineral beneficiation techniques comprise a full course in many undergraduate curriculum. Then there is concentration using a pulp. I will I will dis discuss an example of this in detail. Sizing by hydro hydraulic classification means that you have devices where it can be air or it can be fluid and the entire body of ore is sent in and the whole thing circulates like this and there is a separation between some which go up and some particles which sink. They all uh, make use of the properties of size and density differences. Now, the pulp a concentration using a pulp is a very important uh, method of separating different kinds of minerals. By a pulp we mean the solids that have been crushed and ground and then it is it's mixed with water. So, we have solids say 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent solids in water, it is called a pulp. It, it can be agitated, it can be made to flow, so we will say a pulp is flowing. 
Now, when you have a pulp, there are many devices that can be used to separate different minerals from one another, exploiting the properties of size, densi density and shape. Size, density and shape all defined the way particles move in a pulp and I will give an example that will perhaps make things more clear. Then there is magnetic separation devices which make use of magnetic permeability and susceptibility. So, if, if you have a, 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 in an ore a lot of mineral particles which have been liberated and if there are magnetic minerals using magnetic devices we can separate them from the non magnetic ones. In fact, we will come to some examples where there can be a series of uh, minerals of gradually changing magnetic properties, they can be separated using magnetic separation. Same as with electrostatic separation, I gave you an example and flotation is very important for sulphides, because the sulphide particles attach themselves to soap bubbles. And so, if you have a finer uh, finely ground sulphide particles, they can be separated from the gang simply by the flotation technique. And we will see that in the case of some sulphides like copper sulphide, the ore may contain only 1 percent copper sulphide, but after crushing and grinding, if we under if they are sent through flotation device, uh, we get a concentrate on the surface which is about 25 to 30 percent copper sulphide. The gang materials do not float, they sink at the bottom, but the sulphides come to the top. There are also other methods like coagulation, uh, adsorption, filtration, drying, uh, agglomeration, etcetera, etcetera. We are not going to discuss these things because um, there will be other, uh, other times we will see that. Let me discuss here one example which actually is very relevant for India. It is the beneficiation of beach sands. What do we mean by beach sands? Well, I do not have it here, but it is here. In the coastal areas of India, there are certain areas all along our southern coast, way up to the also eastern coast, Orissa side, where there are some some areas where the sand is actually almost black, and it's black because it contains ilmenite. Ilmenite, as some of you know, is written as FeO TiO2 or Fe TiO3. Is a source of titanium. Now, the beach sands in the Tamil Nadu coast, this is an analysis given in one source, make, it may contain from 8 to 52 percent ilmenite, zircon 0.87 to 10, silimanite, rutile, rutile is TiO2, then garnet, silica, monazite, this is an important this is important because it is a source of thorium and rare earths and there are some others. In the Kerala beaches also we find some beach sands containing as high as 80 percent ilmenite, there is also zircon, silimanite, rutile, garnet and monazite. There are beach sands of Odisha also, which they contain all these things. Now, these are all very valuable minerals. From ilmenite, we get not only titanium, we also produce TiO2, which goes into the paint industry. TiO2 is very white. From zircon, we get zirconium, and from monazite, we get thoria, rare earths, and many other elements. Actually, it is very interesting that. Uh, 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 there is an interesting theory as to why the olive ridley turtles come 
for to deposit their eggs in a certain area in Orissa called Gohir Matha. You may have heard about Gohir Matha. Around the month of February, thousands of turtles come to, dip, to lay their eggs in, in the beaches and which hatch and then uh, and the hatchlings will go into the sea. One of the reasons they say why the olive ridley turtles come to Gohir Matha is because we have the beach sand with ilmenite, very dark they absorb sun's rays and they are very warm. So, the, the, the sand bed, beach sand bed is very warm there and it just, just right uh, for the turtles. They have found the spot where the eggs will hatch because they drop their eggs, they cover them and they go away into the sea. Anyway, the, what I am trying to say is we have a very valuable resource in the beach sands in many locations along our coastline from Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Kerala. And this is a very valuable mineral that needs to be processed to extract different uh, minerals out of that and then different, uh, different compounds and different metals. How do you treat a, a complex mixture like this? The treatment of such ore bodies, which have so many different kinds of minerals, all with different properties, uh, has actually have evolved over hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. And people have found different ways of doing things by trial and error. And now only the science is trying to understand exactly how these things work. There are similar techniques in our household things also. Like if you have, you may have seen our housewives, if when they take, um, there's, a, there's a dirt in the wheat, they have a pan, they keep doing that and they keep blowing that. So, the, the lighter ones, um, dust particles and, they, uh, and their coverings, they, they, have flown, they flow, fly away and they get something. This is a kind of technique is also adopted in, in the mineral industry. Now, I, I used to be fascinated by the techniques that are adopted in the, in the mineral industries. And where I, I worked in regional research laboratory in Bhubaneswar, very near that, there is uh, Indian rare earths, which process beach sands primarily for production of TiO2 and also to get the other fractions like monazite, ga garnet, siliminite, etcetera, which will go into other industries. Now, there in a, in a place like that, there are a whole a series of mineral beneficiation techniques are adopted, unit operations, electrostatic separation, magnetic separators, etc, etc, etc. I will describe only one uh, apparatus, which is called the spider, which is a very useful uh, equipment for separation of different minerals based on size, density and shape. Now, if you see the, the principle of one, you will see how similar principles have been employed elsewhere. Now, in the beach sands I have just described, there are actually some minerals we call very heavy minerals. This very heavy minerals means ilmenite, zircon, monazite. These are very heavy minerals. Then we have heavy minerals, this is not O, this is bracket closed. Heavy minerals, which are garnet and siliconite. And then we have lighter minerals like silica. This is maybe around 2, this will go up to 7, 8, 9, 10, that kind of density. Now, we want to find ways of not only separating very heavy minerals and heavy minerals from lighter minerals, but again VHM from HM and then also 
ilmenite from rutile, zircon and monazite. We want to get different fractions out. Now, this device that I am going to describe called spiral concentrator achieves this remarkably well. Now, first of all, let us see what is a spiral con. This is called a single start spiral. The total height would be say something like 3 meters or 4 meters, uh, maybe a little more. See, as high as many holes. A single start means one spiral. There can be multiple start spirals, which mean that at one place you have more than one spiral. Like this spiral is going to occupy say a diameter about say 6 feet or 2 meters. So, if you want another spiral, there has to be another space, then another space. But people have found that they will put one more spiral in between these spaces to go through that. Then there will be another one through. So, there are there are uh, spirals with three starts, means three spirals are at one place. Forget about that. Look at just one spiral. The idea here is that a slurry, the slurry, which means certain amount of solid particles of ore in, in water, will be pumped from the top and it will flow through this vessel. So, it will go round and round and round and round and come out at the bottom. When that is happening, if you see it is it's a, it's a trough which goes with a slope downwards, the, how will the water flow? The water will have 0 velocity in contact with the perimeter it will have a 0 velocity at the center. So, there is a velocity gradient from the center to the side any at any place. At any place here from center to the perimeter there is a velocity gradient. Now, the water will be flowing at a much higher velocity towards the perimeter it will be it will be it will slow down towards the center and we say that in the perimeter in the outermost area mostly water with fine particles will flow because trapped by the high velocity of water water is flowing pretty high velocity all the fine particles will go at the side as you go we go inward towards the center there is a small area where the water velocity is maximum, because as I mentioned at the perimeter it is 0, velocity is also 0 in the center. Somewhere in the center the velocity is maximum and when it is flowing so fast not much separation of minerals take place, but as we come closer to the center the inner regions most active when velocity begins to slow down. Why is the business to slow down? Because of friction, drag and heavier minerals begin to separate. Look at this diagram, which is little more, um, uh, makes it little more clearer. The slurry is going through this device, flowing through this device and at every stage from the outer sections we are tapping out some water we are tapping out some water from the middle part, from the middle part and we will we'll take out something from the central part. Now, th this is the cross section of, uh, of uh, one place here. Now, you see the not only there is a gradient in water velocity as you go from the center to the side there will be gradient in water velocity in the vertical direction also, because the heavier particles are beginning to come towards the center. 
So the water will f find it difficult to go through. So there are all kinds of things happening in this device. Summon substances, very light particles will fly towards the periphery, they will get separated and the heavier minerals depending on not only the density but size also begin to aggregate towards the center, but there are also fractionation amongst them and there are there are devices to tap them from different places. So, that at the end we get three products, one the lighter products at the periphery are taken out, the heavy minerals will come at the bottom, in between we will have the mid links. This kind of device separates the minerals and the separation will depend on a large number of factors. But again go through wha what is happening there, outermost mostly water with fine particles trapped by high velocity water means silica will get eliminated. Then where there is maximum water velocity not match is happening, it is only the inner regions where the they will get minerals will begin to separate depending on their density and size. How do you study this? Now, some of my friends and I looked at only one spiral where they were trying to separate these minerals and the, they have had an operation going on for some 20 years. Because there is lot of trial and error involved in knowing how you separate the minerals and the general wisdom said that there are three factors which are most important and these are what we say first of all throughput, how much you are sending through the spiral per hour and the other is the concentration of the particular mineral in the mass, in the mass of minerals and the third one is the pulp density. What is the fraction of solids in the water? There are some other things we do not know, uh, we, we need not consider. I, I do not know whether I am able to make it clear, but we have a device which is going to separate the minerals depending on their density and the operators find through their trial and error that they have to control three factors as to how much they pour from the top per hour. Because if you pour too much, too fast separation is not effective. If you send too little of that uh, slurry separation not too effective, you need to have a certain concentration of uh, the solids in, in water. If it is too high, it does not work very well, it is too low, it does not work very well and also it depends on how much of a particular mineral you have in the input mass for it to be recovered effectively. Now, we have looked at their data and there are some statistical techniques uh, which is called statistical design of experiments. We developed an equation like this that in the product we said first of all let us consider the entire hot metal several minerals at a time. Amount in the concentrate will depend on tons per hour, what is the feed rate, it will depend on percentage solid, it will depend on percentage hot metal in the feed and so on and so forth. So, we were able to quantitatively develop an equation that if we want three or four hot heavy metals together, the total yield will be defined by these parameters like this. Tons per hour feed rate, percentage solid and also the how much of that heavy metals is in their total world. Subsequently, we have done it for a every single mineral and such equations have been developed. So, an operation which was basically developed by entire error, we tried to put science into it. Looking at their own data, their own data over say 10 years 
uh, five years, we picked up certain, we selected some data, developed some equations, and when you have an equation like that, which expresses the yield of the total heavy metals or yield of a particular mineral in terms of factors like the tonnage uh, uh, that you are sending through a percentage of total solid, percentage of metal or hot metal in the mass, you can develop an equation. Now, once you have an equation, you can go through an optimization technique to maximize that under what conditions of throughput, solid concentration and hot metal in feed or the particular metal in feed, you will get the maximum yield. We have done that and actually computers do that if you feed right kind of data and we had this kind of information. We have found equations for heavy metals, heavy minerals, very heavy minerals, then individually for ilmenite, garnet, monazite, rutile, zircon, silimanite, everything has been done. So, the beauty now is that we found what will be the optimum conditions that we found mathematically and these are the ones we predicted that under this kind of conditions, this is what will happen and their 15 or 20 years experience, they said these are the kind of data they had and it was very interesting what they have done over 15, 20 years. You can do that in two months if you pick up the right kind of data and then you say these are the optimum conditions for getting maximum yield of this mineral. Well, this can be done put in terms of the computer can also print them that for heavy metal in this case uh, for it is heavy heavy mineral it can be for any very heavy minerals all together or single minerals. We can plot them heavy mineral concent in the concentrate as a function of percentage solid and tonnage per hour. We did something like that for very heavy minerals also and then the computer uh, gives a software also that for any particular uh, concentration if you want this much of concentration in the product you have to you can cut it through this you can get a horizontal thing surface that for different concentrations of uh, very uh, very heavy mineral 42, 44, 46, 48, 50 these are there are different combinations of solids and tonnage per hour will give you that. I uh, will stop it here now and I will simply say that I am sorry I do not want to go into the details of this topic, but mineral beneficiation technique is actually uh, it depends very heavily on trial and error over centuries and now this uh, equipment have been standardized, but we can play around with this equipment to do lot of scientific research, bring in lot of science, lot of mathematics and give them optimization techniques which will minimize the labor that they have to put in to find what are the best conditions. So, to summarize mineral beneficiation means mineral dressing and they refer to unit operations which will make an ore body more suitable for an industrial extraction process and all unit operations exploit certain property of the minerals. To start with comminution which is size reduction will make use of their brittleness and then there are other properties. Rarely would a unit operation change the physical and chemical nature of minerals, but there can be some exceptions as I mentioned. I will not discuss this subject anymore, but everywhere subsequently whenever we talk about an extraction process, you will see there will be a reference to some one or more mineral beneficiation technique and if necessary I will give you little more detail. I have, give a, I have given a particular example of use of a spiral uh, 
if you are interested, you can you can read that up in the internet or in any book. And thank you very much.